Chapter 14 Destruction of Sodom This chapter is based on Genesis 19. Fairest among the cities of the Jordan Valley was Sodom, set in a plain which was as the garden of the Lord in its fertility and beauty. Here the luxuriant vegetation of the tropics flourished. Here was the home of the palm tree, the olive, and the vine, and flowers shed their fragrance throughout the year. Rich harvests clothed the fields, and flocks and herds covered the encircling hills. Art and commerce contributed to enrich the proud city of the plain. The treasures of the east adorned her palaces, and the caravans of the desert brought their stores of precious things to supply her marts of trade. With little thought or labor, every want of life could be supplied, and the whole year seemed one round of festivity. The profusion reigning everywhere gave birth to luxury and pride. Idleness and riches made the heart hard that has ever been oppressed by want or burdened by sorrow. The love of pleasure was fostered by wealth and leisure, and the people gave themselves up to sensual indulgence. Behold, says the prophet, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50. There is nothing more desired among men than riches and leisure, and yet these gave birth to the sins that brought destruction upon the cities of the plain. Their useless, idle life made them a prey to Satan's temptations, and they defaced the image of God and became satanic rather than divine. Idleness is the greatest curse that can fall upon man, for vice and crime follow in its train. It enfeebles the mind, perverts the understanding, and debases the soul. Satan lies in ambush, ready to destroy those who are unguarded, whose leisure gives him opportunity to insinuate himself under some attractive disguise. He is never more successful than when he comes to men in their idle hours. In Sodom there was mirth and revelry, feasting and drunkenness. The vilest and most brutal passions were unrestrained. The people often defied God and His law and delighted in deeds of violence. Though they had before them the example of the antediluvian world and knew how the wrath of God had been manifested in their destruction, yet they followed the same course of wickedness. At the time of Lot's removal to Sodom, corruption had not become universal, and God in His mercy permitted rays of light to shine amid the moral darkness. When Abraham rescued the captives from the Elamites, the attention of the people was called to the true faith. Abraham was not a stranger to the people of Sodom, and his worship of the unseen God had been a matter of ridicule among them. But his victory over greatly superior forces and his magnanimous disposition of the prisoners and spoil excited wonder and admiration. While his skill and valor were extolled, none could avoid the conviction that a divine power had made him conqueror and his noble and unselfish spirit, so foreign to the self-seeking inhabitants of Sodom, was another evidence of the superiority of the religion which he had honored by his courage and fidelity. Melchizedek, in bestowing the benediction upon Abraham, had acknowledged Jehovah as the source of his strength and the author of the victory. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Genesis chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. God was speaking to that people by His providence, but the last ray of light was rejected as all before had been. And now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of vengeance cast their shadows over the devoted city but men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, 
men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other that had come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of the declining sun. The coolness of eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city, and the pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. In the twilight, two strangers drew near to the city gate. They were apparently travelers coming in to tarry for the night. None could discern in those humble wayfarers the mighty heralds of divine judgment, and little dreamed the gay, careless multitude that in their treatment of these heavenly messengers, that very night, they would reach the climax of the guilt which doomed their proud city. But there was one man who manifest kindly attention toward the strangers and invited them to his home. Lot did not know their true character, but politeness and hospitality were habitual with him. They were a part of his religion, lessons that he had learned from the example of Abraham. Had he not cultivated a spirit of courtesy, he might have been left to perish with the rest of Sodom. Many a household, in closing its doors against a stranger, has shut out God's messenger, who would have brought blessing and hope and peace. Every act of life, however small, has its bearing for good or for evil. Faithfulness or neglect in what are apparently the smallest duties may open the door for life's richest blessings or its greatest calamities. It is little things that test the character. It is the unpretending acts of daily self-denial performed with a cheerful, willing heart that God smiles upon. We are not to live for self, but for others. And it is only by self-forgetfulness, by cherishing a loving, helpful spirit, that we can make our life a blessing. The little attentions, the small, simple courtesies, go far to make up the sum of life's happiness, and the neglect of these constitutes no small share of human wretchedness. Seeing the abuse to which strangers were exposed in Sodom, Lot made it one of his duties to guard them at their entrance by offering them entertainment at his own house. He was sitting at the gate as the travelers approached, and upon observing them, he rose from his place to meet them and bowing courteously said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night. They seemed to decline his hospitality, saying, Nay, but we will abide in the street. Their object in this answer was twofold, to test the sincerity of Lot, and also to appear ignorant of the character of the men of Sodom, as if they supposed it safe to remain in the street at night. Their answer made Lot the more determined not to leave them to the mercy of the rabble. He pressed his invitation until they yielded, and accompanied him to his house. He had hoped to conceal his intention from the idlers at the gate by bringing the strangers to his home by a circuitous route. But their hesitation and delay and his persistent urging caused them to be observed, and before they had retired for the night, a lawless crowd gathered about the house. It was an immense company, youth and aged men alike, inflamed by the vilest passions. The strangers had been making inquiry in regard to the character of the city, and Lot had warned them not to venture out of his door that night, when the hooting and jeers of the mob were heard, demanding that the men be brought out to them. Knowing that if provoked to violence, they could easily break into his house, Lot went out to try the effect of persuasion upon them. I pray you, brethren, he said, do not so wickedly, using the term brethren in the sense of neighbors, and hoping to conciliate them and make them ashamed of their vile purposes. But his words were like oil upon the flames. Their rage became like the roaring of a tempest. They mocked Lot as making himself a judge over them, and threatened to deal worse with him than they had purposed toward his guests. They rushed upon him and would have torn him in pieces had he not been rescued by the angels of God. The heavenly messengers put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. The events that followed revealed the character of the guests he had entertained. They smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, 
both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Had they not been visited with double blindness, being given up to hardness of heart, the stroke of God upon them would have caused them to fear and to desist from their evil work. That last night was marked by no greater sins than many others before it, but mercy, so long slighted, had at last ceased its pleading. The inhabitants of Sodom had passed the limits of divine forbearance, the hidden boundary between God's patience and His wrath. The fires of His vengeance were about to be kindled in the vale of Siddim. The angels revealed to Lot the object of their mission. We will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The strangers whom Lot had endeavored to protect now promised to protect him and to save also all the members of his family who would flee with him from the wicked city. The mob had worried themselves out and departed, and Lot went out to warn his children. He repeated the words of the angels, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed to them as one that mocked. They laughed at what they called his superstitious fears. His daughters were influenced by their husbands. They were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. They had great possessions, and they could not believe it possible that beautiful Sodom would be destroyed. Lot returned sorrowfully to his home and told the story of his failure. Then the angels bade him arise and take his wife and the two daughters who were yet in his house and leave the city. But Lot delayed. Though daily distressed at beholding deeds of violence, he had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile city. He did not realize the terrible necessity for God's judgments to put a check on sin. Some of his children clung to Sodom, and his wife refused to depart without them. The thought of leaving those whom he held dearest on earth seemed more than he could bear. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. Stupefied with sorrow, he lingered, loath to depart. But for the angels of God, they would all have perished in the ruin of Sodom. The heavenly messengers took him and his wife and daughters by the hand and led them out of the city. Here the angels left them and turned back to Sodom to accomplish their work of destruction. Another, he with whom Abraham had pleaded, drew near to Lot. In all the cities of the plain, even ten righteous persons had not been found. But in answer to the patriarch's prayer, the one man who feared God was snatched from destruction. The command was given with startling vehemence, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Hesitancy or delay now would be fatal. To cast one lingering look upon the devoted city, to tarry for one moment from regret to leave so beautiful a home, would have cost their life. The storm of divine judgment was only waiting that these poor fugitives might make their escape. But Lot, confused and terrified, pleaded that he could not do as he was required, lest some evil should overtake him and he should die. Living in that wicked city, in the midst of unbelief, his faith had grown dim. The Prince of Heaven was by his side, yet he pleaded for his own life as though God, who had manifest such care, and love for him would not still preserve him. He should have trusted himself wholly to the divine messenger, giving his will and his life into the Lord's hands without a doubt or a question. But like so many others, he endeavored to plan for himself. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. The city here mentioned was Bela, afterward called Zoar. It was but a few miles from Sodom, and like it, was corrupt and doomed to destruction. But Lot asked that it might be spared, urging that this was but a small request, 
and his desire was granted. The Lord assured him, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for the which thou hast spoken. Oh, how great the mercy of God toward his erring creatures! Again the solemn command was given to hasten, for the fiery storm would be delayed but little longer. But one of the fugitives ventured to cast a look backward to the doomed city, and she became a monument of God's judgment. If Lot himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had earnestly fled toward the mountains, without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. The influence of his example would have saved her from that sin that sealed her doom. But his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine warning. While her body was upon the plain, her heart clung to Sodom, and she perished with it. She rebelled against God because his judgments involved her possessions and her children in the ruin. Although so greatly favored in being called out from that wicked city, she felt that she was severely dealt with, because the wealth that it had taken years to accumulate must be left to destruction. Instead of thankfully accepting deliverance, she presumptuously looked back to desire the life of those who had rejected the divine warning. Her sin showed her to be unworthy of life, for the preservation of which she felt so little gratitude. We should beware of treating lightly God's gracious provisions for our salvation. There are Christians who say, I do not care to be saved unless my companion and children are saved with me. They feel that heaven would not be heaven to them without the presence of those who are so dear. But have those who cherish this feeling a right conception of their own relation to God in view of His great goodness and mercy toward them? Have they forgotten that they are bound by the strongest ties of love and honor and loyalty to the service of their Creator and Redeemer? The invitations of mercy are addressed to all, and because our friends reject the Savior's pleading love, shall we also turn away? The redemption of the soul is precious. Christ has paid an infinite price for our salvation, and no one who appreciates the value of this great sacrifice or the worth of the soul will despise God's offered mercy because others choose to do so. The very fact that others are ignoring his just claims should arouse us to greater diligence, that we may honor God ourselves and lead all whom we can influence to accept his love. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. The bright rays of the morning seemed to speak only prosperity and peace to the cities of the plain. The stir of active life began in the streets. Men were going their various ways, intent on the business or the pleasures of the day. The sons-in-law of Lot were making merry at the fears and warnings of the weak-minded old man. Suddenly and unexpectedly, as would be a thunder peal from an unclouded sky, the tempest broke. The Lord rained brimstone and fire out of heaven upon the cities and the fruitful plain. Its palaces and temples, costly dwellings, gardens and vineyards, and the gay pleasure-seeking throngs that only the night before had insulted the messengers of heaven, all were consumed. The smoke of the conflagration went up like the smoke of a great furnace, and the fair vale of Siddim became a desolation, a place never to be built up or inhabited, a witness to all generations of the certainty of God's judgments upon transgression. The flames that consumed the cities of the plain shed their warning light down even to our time. We are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears long with the transgressor, there is a limit beyond which men may not go in sin. When that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. The Redeemer of the world declares that there are greater sins than that for which Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Those who hear the gospel invitation calling sinners to repentance and heed it not are more guilty before God than were the dwellers in the vale of Siddim. And still greater sin is theirs who profess to know God and to keep His commandments, yet who deny Christ in their character 
and their daily life. In the light of the Savior's warning, the fate of Sodom is a solemn admonition, not merely to those who are guilty of outbreaking sin, but to all who are trifling with heaven-sent light and privileges. Said the true witness to the church at Ephesus, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The Savior watches for a response to his offers of love and forgiveness, with a more tender compassion than that which moves the heart of an earthly parent to forgive a wayward, suffering son. He cries after the wanderer, Return unto me, and I will return unto you. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. But if the erring one persistently refuses to heed the voice that calls him with pitying, tender love, he will at last be left in darkness. The heart that has long slighted God's mercy becomes hardened in sin and is no longer susceptible to the influence of the grace of God. Fearful will be the doom of that soul of whom the pleading Savior shall finally declare, He is joined to idols, let him alone. Hosea chapter 4 verse 17. It will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the cities of the plain than for those who have known the love of Christ and yet have turned away to choose the pleasures of a world of sin. You who are slighting the offers of mercy, think of the long array of figures accumulating against you in the books of heaven. For there is a record kept of the impieties of nations, of families, of individuals. God may bear long while the account goes on, and calls to repentance and offers of pardon may be given. Yet a time will come when the account will be full, when the soul's decision has been made, when by his own choice man's destiny has been fixed. Then the signal will be given for judgment to be executed. There is cause for alarm in the condition of the religious world today. God's mercy has been trifled with. The multitudes make void the law of Jehovah, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. Infidelity prevails in many of the churches in our land. Not infidelity in its broadest sense, an open denial of the Bible, but an infidelity that is robed in the garb of Christianity, while it is undermining faith in the Bible as a revelation from God. Fervent devotion and vital piety have given place to hollow formalism. As the result, apostasy and sensualism prevail. Christ declared, As it was in the days of Lot, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Luke chapter 17, verses 28 and 30. The daily record of passing events testifies to the fulfillment of His words. The world is fast becoming ripe for destruction. Soon the judgments of God are to be poured out, and sin and sinners are to be consumed. Said our Savior, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, upon all whose interests are centered in this world. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Before the destruction of Sodom, God sent a message to Lot, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. The same voice of warning was heard by the disciples of Christ before the destruction of Jerusalem. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Luke chapter 21, verses 20 and 21. 
they must not tarry to secure anything from their possessions, but must make the most of the opportunity to escape. There was a coming out, a decided separation from the wicked, an escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, so with Lot, so with the disciples prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, and so it will be in the last days. Again, the voice of God is heard in a message of warning, bidding his people separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. The state of corruption and apostasy that in the last days would exist in the religious world was presented to the prophet John in the vision of Babylon, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18. Before its destruction, the call is to be given from heaven, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. As in the days of Noah and Lot, there must be a marked separation from sin and sinners. There can be no compromise between God and the world, no turning back to secure earthly treasures. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Like the dwellers in the Vale of Siddim, the people are dreaming of prosperity and peace. Escape for thy life is the warning from the angels of God. But other voices are heard saying, Be not excited. There is no cause for alarm. The multitudes cry, Peace and safety, while heaven declares that swift destruction is about to come upon the transgressor. On the night prior to their destruction, the cities of the plain rioted in pleasure and derided the fears and warnings of the messenger of God. But those scoffers perished in the flames. That very night, the door of mercy was forever closed to the wicked, careless inhabitants of Sodom. God will not always be mocked. He will not long be trifled with. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. The great mass of the world will reject God's mercy and will be overwhelmed in swift and irretrievable ruin. But those who heed the warning shall dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. His truth shall be their shield and buckler. For them is the promise, With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91, verses 1, 4, and 16. Lot dwelt but a short time in Zoar. Iniquity prevailed there as in Sodom, and he feared to remain lest the city should be destroyed. Not long after, Zoar was consumed, as God had purposed. Lot made his way to the mountains and abode in a cave, stripped of all for which he had dared to subject his family to the influences of a wicked city. But the curse of Sodom followed him even there. The sinful conduct of his daughters was the result of the evil associations of that vile place. Its moral corruption had become so interwoven with their character that they could not distinguish between good and evil. Lot's only posterity, the Moabites and Ammonites, were vile, idolatrous tribes, rebels against God, and bitter enemies of his people. In how wide contrast to the life of Abraham was that of Lot. Once they had been companions, worshiping at one altar, dwelling side by side in their pilgrim tents, but how widely separated now. Lot had chosen Sodom for its pleasure and profit. Leaving Abraham's altar and its daily sacrifice to the living God, he had permitted his children to mingle with a corrupt and idolatrous people. Yet he had retained in his heart the fear of God, for he is declared in the scriptures to have been a just man. His righteous soul was vexed with the vile conversation that greeted his ears daily and the violence and crime he was powerless to prevent. He was saved at last as a brand plucked out of the fire. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2. Yet, stripped of his possessions, bereaved of his wife and children, dwelling in caves, like the wild beasts, 
covered with infamy in his old age. And he gave to the world not a race of righteous men, but two idolatrous nations at enmity with God and warring upon his people, until their cup of iniquity being full, they were appointed to destruction. How terrible were the results that followed one unwise step. Say the wise man, labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 4, chapter 15 verse 27. And the Apostle Paul declares, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. When Lot entered Sodom, he fully intended to keep himself free from iniquity and to command his household after him. But he signally failed. The corrupting influences about him had an effect upon his own faith, and his children's connection with the inhabitants of Sodom bound up his interest in a measure with theirs. The result is before us. Many are still making a similar mistake. In selecting a home, they look more to the temporal advantages they may gain than to the moral and social influences that will surround themselves and their families. They choose a beautiful and fertile country or remove to some flourishing city in the hope of securing greater prosperity. But their children are surrounded by temptation, and too often they form associations that are unfavorable to the development of piety and the formation of a right character. The atmosphere of lax morality, of unbelief, of indifference to religious things, has a tendency to counteract the influence of the parents. Examples of rebellion against parental and divine authority are ever before the youth. Many form attachments for infidels and unbelievers and cast in their lot with the enemies of God. In choosing a home, God would have us consider, first of all, the moral and religious influences that will surround us and our families. We may be placed in trying positions, for many cannot have their surroundings what they would. And whenever duty calls us, God will enable us to stand uncorrupted if we watch and pray, trusting in the grace of Christ. But we should not needlessly expose ourselves to influences that are unfavorable to the formation of Christian character. When we voluntarily place ourselves in an atmosphere of worldliness and unbelief, we displease God and drive holy angels from our homes. Those who secure for their children worldly wealth and honor at the expense of their eternal interests will find in the end that these advantages are a terrible loss. Like Lot, many see their children ruined and barely save their own souls. Their life work is lost. Their life is a sad failure. Had they exercised true wisdom, their children might have had less of worldly prosperity, but they would have made sure of a title to the immortal inheritance. The heritage that God has promised to his people is not in this world. Abraham had no possession in the earth, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Acts chapter 7, verse 5. He possessed great substance, and he used it to the glory of God and the good of his fellow men. But he did not look upon this world as his home, the Lord had called him to leave his idolatrous countrymen with the promise of the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. Yet, neither he nor his son nor his son's son received it. When Abraham desired a burial place for his dead, he had to buy it of the Canaanites. His sole possession in the land of promise was that rock-hewn tomb in the cave of Machpelah. But the word of God had not failed neither did it meet its final accomplishment in the occupation of Canaan by the Jewish people. To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Abraham himself was to share the inheritance. The fulfillment of God's promise may seem to be long delayed, for one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It may appear to tarry, but at the appointed time it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. The gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. So says the apostle, the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. All that are Christ's are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, the earth freed from the curse of sin. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. For the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, and Psalm 37, verse 11. God gave to Abraham a view of this immortal inheritance, and with this hope he was content. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Of the posterity of Abraham it is written, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. We must dwell as pilgrims and strangers here if we would gain a better country, that is, an heavenly. Verse 16. Those who are children of Abraham will be seeking the city which he looked for, whose builder and maker is God.